On this hunt, I'm spearfishing the murky waters of the Gulf of Mexico beneath massive oil rigs that function as towering artificial reefs. Fish love rigs. That's why we're here, because it's 100% guaranteed. 100% guaranteed. Oh. My buddy and spearfishing mentor, Greg Fonts, and his Spearow buddy, Brandon, will help me navigate these waters as we hunt a handful of prized species, including a couple fish I've never gotten before. Of all the fish on the planet, that's the fish I'd most like to catch. Let's make it happen. We just hope the sharks don't mind us poking around their turf. I've followed trails of all kinds, pursuing wild game through our country's wildest places. These are my stories. These are my people. <laughs> I'm Steven Ranella, and this is Meat Eater. I've been chasing fish with a snorkel and spear on and off for most of my life, but I've only gotten really serious about it over the last three or four years. And by serious, I mean learning how to free dive down to the fish in deeper water rather than just prowling the shallows. While I'm still a newbie to the practice, I can say my skills are progressing along, thanks in large measure to this fella right here, Greg. I told Greg we might cancel the trip today just to go bullfrog, and you can hear three of them grow. They're at all night. You're hearing them? Is it open? When's the season? It's open, I it's think. Open. Yeah. In addition to being a fire department captain in West Sacramento, California, Greg owns a spearfishing shop called RobAllenDiving.com and has traveled the world in search of big game fish. When I was just spearfishing curious, Greg took me under his wing and became a mentor. Love you. I hope you have a great day. I'll let you know when we start getting back. Any chance I can find to join him in the water, I'm in. For this go around, Greg has invited me down to hunt the rich waters of the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. His buddy, Brandon Hendrickson, runs a rod and reel charter service specializing in tuna and swordfish called ecstatic sport fishing. But he likes to spend his off days with a spear gun in his hand. In this case, that's three days off, and we're gonna spend that time targeting some of the finest eating fish in the Gulf. We'll be hitting a pile of locations, including some opportunistic dives when the right situation happens to present itself. Knowing the Gulf well means knowing what other fishermen are up to, and shrimpers are the kinds of fishermen that are particularly interesting to Brandon. This is a shrimp boat, but they're anchored up. But these guys process a lot of stuff. All that refuse goes in the water. And then if you look down in the water here, you can see this just pile of jack creval, which aren't a good eating fish, but there could be other stuff in here. Catch the shrimpers at the right time when they're dumping the bycatch and shrimp heads left over from cleaning the night's catch, and you might land yourself in a vortex of predatory fish engaged in a feeding frenzy. But the majority of our time will be spent in much more fixed locations. Depending on who you ask and how you define them, there are somewhere between 1,800 and 6,000 oil and gas structures currently installed within 200 miles of the Gulf Coast. Some operational, some long out of commission, they range in size from simple wellheads known to fishermen as lollipops to massive floating behemoths that might cover 20 acres or more. Even in the dark or fog, you can't miss these rigs as they're equipped with lights and insanely loud signal horns to warn oncoming vessels of their presence and make it very hard for fishermen to even think and talk. The rigs create all kinds of fish habitat because it creates artificial reef. So fish love rigs. So the fishermen love rigs. That's why we're here. Opinions about what to do with retired offline structures are as varied as the rigs themselves. Brandon's deckhand, Brady, has been working the Gulf, both as a welder on the rigs as well as an angler in the water, for over 30 years and has witnessed the policy vacillations firsthand. 
at a time, people really loved the rigs, and they had this program called Rigs to Reefs, right? Yep. Cut it off where it's still safe to travel over it, yep. but leave some structure. Acknowledging the fact that, like them or not, removing these structures might be detrimental to an abundance of marine life, the government set out to officially convert obsolete rigs into permanent fish habitat. They went about this in various ways. They were tipping them over for a while, and they do have some big ones they tipped over. Yeah. They were dynamiting them for a while. Yeah, I've been on some of them jobs. And it would kill... Ungodly amounts of fish. Ungodly amounts yeah. of fish. Some people still weren't happy, particularly the shrimpers whose trawling nets would end up getting caught on the partial structures. Eventually, and unfortunately in my opinion, the anti-rig voices have been winning out. And then they had a program called Idle Iron, and they started to cut all this out. Yeah. They wanted the oil companies to like leave it the way they found yeah. it. They cut them so deep below the mud line too. Oh, they do? Yeah, so it's gone. Then they'll set a sonar. Just so much as a Coke can, anything down there, they see it, they clean the whole area. Really? Yeah. Like they're, they're never they're there? Sweet. Done. And all those fish are like... Gone. A lot of times they follow the bar as far as they can, and they think we're all... <laughs> like my house going. They try to stay with their house until yeah. it gets to the beach. Think about it, it's a desert. You know, this is a tree. Yeah. That's all there is to it. That's all they got. They removed 200 and some Saw last year? Saw a rig killer yesterday. A rig killer? Yeah. Rig reefer, rig, rig killer. killer. I think there's nothing scarier than the rate they're pulling them out. Like when the they good ones are The cherished. good ones are really good, and you cherish those spots, and yeah. when they remove that, it's just. I had a spear fisherman from uh, over by Grand Isle once say to me, it's like losing a friend. <laughs> <laughs> like everything cool, someone doesn't like it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Due to the rig reaping, this resource has a temporary feel to it, like you're seeing something that's gonna vanish before your eyes right in your own lifetime. Makes you wanna get in the water real bad and see what's down there. And I'm warning you, it's not just the yummy kinds of fish. Brandon has a funny story about a time that he jumped into the water behind a shrimp boat with his spear gun and the shrimper yelled down to say, you wouldn't do that if you'd seen what I've seen behind this boat. What would be the shark thing that you would see that would make you not want to be in the water? Aggressive, yeah. tubering. So it's not the size, it's the attitude. It's the body language, yeah. yeah. So you could get in there and there could be like an eight foot tiger shark and if he was acting chill, you wouldn't care. Correct. I probably wouldn't jump in with a, with a mako regardless, but I know people who have and have done so successfully. Yeah. But uh, generally, it's just body language. And then if it's a little four-foot shark pissed off, do you still get out of the water? No, not usually. OK. Uh, if there's more than one, yeah. More than one pissed off yeah. four-foot shark? Yeah, he's kind of just reading the situation. Sometimes you can shoot a fish right in the middle of them, and it's just if, as long as they're calm. We just sit there and deal with the fish. And stuff. Yeah. Once they start zipping around and really moving, that's when you know. So do you ever get in the water and realize, like, right away, you get in the water, like, this is not good, and get back out? Rarely. Yeah. Rarely, OK. Rarely. So yeah. it, it builds up. Their yeah. irritation builds up. Yeah. yeah. The problem with tigers, though, is they'll wander in and out, right? So they'll be away from you, and then all of a sudden, they'll be right next to you. So they're very calculated. If the viz isn't good, yeah, it's not the best. Because then you don't know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't jump in a bad biz with a tiger. Yeah. <laughs> or a real aggressive bull, like excited bulls and bad biz is not. Yeah. Even though Greg and Brandon are generally, let's say, casual about the presence of sharks, they still stress the absolute importance of paying attention to every single detail when under the water. Avoid getting your gear or lines tangled on yourself or the rigs. Be mindful of barracudas, and don't knock yourself out by crashing your head into a hunk of sharp iron on your ascent. Then you've got the absence of breathable air, which can lead to underwater blackouts that can kill you. And all the while, don't be a total dumbass about the sharks. Get on the rope fast. Don't just let them run, 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 run. Yeah, you want to get the gun away from you, and you want to get the line in your hands and start swimming away from the gun. Yo. So that all that line doesn't bulk up on top of you. The sooner you get him close to you, the less likely the sharks are gonna come in and they're gonna see you and you look like a pretty big animal. Once you got him in hand, got it's it. yours. It's a lot to keep in mind, man. What's like the normal things you'd expect to see and what would be the cool thing to see that would be slightly unexpected? 
Meaning you don't need to name like everything in the ocean. Right? I'd, ex I'd expect to see sharks for yeah. one. Yeah. The cool thing would be to see some yellowfin tuna. Okay. Uh, because it's not every day you see them. Cobia. Good chance of seeing some cobia. Of all the fish on the planet, that's the fish I'd most like to catch. I've never caught one on rod and reel. I've never speared one. Of all the fish on the planet. All the fish. Do you know how many fish are on this planet? <laughs> I don't either, but it's a shitload. And of all of them, that's the one I want to catch. Cobia. Let's make it happen. Yeah. I was thinking, with all of my anticipation about getting a cobia, it might take me a while or maybe it won't even happen at all. But at our very first shrimp boat, on my very first drop into a swirling mass of sharks and jacks, there he is, just swimming up to see what all the commotion is about. Worried the shaft might come loose from the soft belly tissue, Brandon secures the cobia with another shot. First cobia, man. Nice. Oh, so cool, dude. That was quick. Nice one. Soon after, Greg picks up another. I feel funny pointing it out, but mine is much bigger. It's almost like you shouldn't even talk about it, because then when you talk about it, it seems like you're being ironic, but I mean, it really just is much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so that one probably just crippled right up, huh? Yeah, he just rolled over. Yeah. So that way. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. Sorry, dude, again. I was admiring my fish. Congrats on your first copia, dude. <laughs> dude I was, that was amazing. That was fast. <laughs> Also known as lemon fish and by a host of other names, cobia are one of the best eating fish you can get. Our limit is two per person per day. And over the course of three days, we do real well. Shot to cobia, he ran sideways and back, and he ripped the reel right off the off the gun. If they could find them, it'd be great. I can just see something white going, like in a very unnatural way. <laughs> yeah. And I dove down, yeah, he was tangled up. He was tangled up. Starting to rip real bad, but. Wow. Just barely. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a first. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Next on our list, one of the defining fish of the Gulf. A fish so popular and with such name recognition, many vendors falsely label other fish as this fish, simply because they know there are plenty of folks who will buy it just based on the name. We're gonna try to target Red Snapper the way they regulate Red Snapper. When I was here with you guys last year, it was two a day. Yeah, it changed it to three a day this year. This year, three a day, but weekends yep. only. So right, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Correct. You can fish Red Snapper. Yep. 16 inch minimum. Yep. But that's it. a small. That's a small red snapper for here. Yeah. Red snapper loves structure. Hereabouts, that means the rig support structures that bristle with life. A 2013 study found that 93% of the fish being sold as red snapper in the United States ain't red snapper, but these are. Red snapper. Like first dive. First dive, where's that? I had no idea. Yeah, that's a nice one. There's a bunch more on that corner. Obviously not a ton of fear of people right off the bat. No. He just came right in. Yep. What you really want to do on these is just get to a level where you're comfortable to sit, and they'll naturally start coming in. And a lot of times, the instinct is to shoot one of the first fish that you see 
And a lot of times, if you're a little more patient, they'll start to big, more and more will more come. More big ones, big, yeah. big ones will come through. Oh! Oh, we got a third. Oh. That left one's a little bigger. At the same time, we're also targeting the reds, smaller and less colorful, but just as tasty, and I sort of think a little bit cooler cousin, the mangrove snapper. Once again, over the days, we get plenty of opportunities. Mixed in with a few mildly dramatic moments. Brandon nearly had a showdown with a couple of feisty bull sharks. And my last fish was a doozy. On my final dive of the day, as I was headed back towards the surface, Greg helpfully pointed out a nice red. Who needs air when you got dandy fish? That one about killed me, Greg. <laughs> My mentor's like, oh, I know you're on your way up, but there's one. That's awesome, man. Beautiful fish, huh? Oh, man, look at that thing, Greg. Son of a bitch, look at that thing. That was a big fish. That's, that's what we're looking for. Oh, shit. That's what, oh, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> Our final quest involves a special fish that comes with a bit of ethical baggage. There's tension around triple tail. Like sort of who owns the triple tail? Is it a rod and reel fish or is it a spear gun fish? I think the, the rod and reel guys are pretty protective with them. It's a real treat for them to be able to get one. But are they generally retaining them? For the most part, yes, but but if they catch one or two, it's a, a really good day. Okay. Uh, anything more than that, it's pretty well catching. And when they see one get shot, that's like one they could have caught, is the attitude. Possibly, to a certain, but I think there's been some people in the past that kind of wore it out where they went out and shot the legal limit every oh, time. Got it. And uh, the rod and reel guys don't like seeing that. Got it. So, well, so does that dynamic make you not want to be hard on them? Yes, correct. I like to go get, you know, go get one, and then I'm good. Got it. You know, one per person, I think it's reasonable. So you keep in mind the sort of push and pull of different user groups? We try. Yeah. yeah. You got to be responsible with it. The rigs are very specific. If someone goes back to the same rig over and over again, you're going to exhaust the resource. Whereas if you responsibly take one fish, two fish off of it, and then leave it alone, then it'll be fine. It's easy to over harvest the triple tail. Yeah, and it'd definitely. be real bad form to show in, say, video footage where exactly you're triple tail fishing. I would agree, yes. Yeah. Brandon is extremely protective of his triple tail spot, so much so that he won't allow us to even show what the proper sorts of rigs look like. You want us to all three go down at the same time. Why is that? Because if there's fish there, uh -huh. we're probably only going to have one opportunity. I got you. Okay. So there's a couple of them. You there's might get a couple, a couple of them. We might get a couple of them. I got you. I'm with you now. Okay. Okay. So. Um, and then they're pretty dumb. They're going to let you get pretty close to them. So like very close. We're very close. Yeah. Inches. If you need, if you need to, you should pull your keep your gun back like this. Huh. Use your old trigger finger. You know, your your thumb is your trigger finger. That close. That close. Hunting triple tails requires you to go into the filling of the Oreo, so to speak. That refers to the layers of seriously murky water, 
one at the surface and one toward the bottom, that sandwich a narrow band of somewhat clearer water. Again, the filling of the Oreo. Triple tails will hang in that clearer zone, but then retreat into the dank when pestered. Diving down through the zero-viz portion is harrowing, considering that bull sharks love this stuff. And even when you do hit the clearer stuff, it really isn't clear at all. But that's where you find yourself in a truly alien world, where it's hard to know which way is up and which is down. And lingering over you is the awareness that something nasty could pop out of the murk from any direction and you'd never see it coming. It takes me a few dives to even figure out what the hell is happening down there. It's hard to even find the legs of the rig, as weird as that sounds, and we try a few different spots so I can get it right. Eventually, I get things sort of figured out. Good work, dude. There you go. You're right. You can just approach him. Yep. All of a sudden, there he was. That's a big one. <laughs> otherworldly in that merch. That is awesome, man. Congrats. You're checking the list. Well done. That was incredible. Not long after me, Greg finds success himself. We're dragged out his triple tail. Oh, good job. And finally, Brandon finishes us up with three for the boat. Oh, yeah, man. Well, everybody got one. With that, we call it quits on triple tail. In the mid 1800s, Japanese fishermen used to print their fish to show what they had, like in a fish market, as well as kind of memorialize the fish. You're going to memorialize this fish with yep. a Japanese technique known as? Go you talk. You really want the fish dry as possible. Some people put the fish in the fridge to dry it out. Some people do a, a salt rub on it. Some people don't do anything to it and they just, from the ocean, an hour later, print the fish. Some people actually remove the gills and stuff it to try to get the moisture out of there. Mm -hmm. Some people remove the eye, stuff it with cotton, then draw the eye in afterwards. Mm. But the thing I do do is try to pin the fins up a little bit. This one was being kind of resistant today, but like I've spread the peck fin out to try to get the fish at least on and the are you gonna a little pin bit. that fin open? That is pinned open. Where's the pen? You can't see it. You, oh, just, you just ripped the pen out. I just out. ripped the pen out and uh, very discreetly pinned. Discreetly pinned. Okay, I'm into All it. Right. Let's see it. There's a million different ways you can do this. We're gonna use like a Sumi ink. Traditionally, it was done with a squid ink, but now you can do printer's ink or Sumi ink. And all the ink is non-toxic. You can rinse it off before you flay it. It's not a big deal. As you do each print, you can kind of say, oh, I need less ink there, more ink there. Or, as many tries as you want. Yeah. But it's kind of fun to just do this and kind of think about the trip and memorialize the trip a little bit, or like a special fish. And this was a special fish This was a very sure. special fish. And this is just touching the surface of this type of printing. That's um, crap. And there are some people that are- It's a delicate craft. Absolute experts at it. I dabble. So Brandon, you've seen, uh, there are roving craftsmen, if you will, who go to fish tournaments with the gear. Ready to go. Yeah, I've never seen that. Yeah, you go to the, the big marlin tournaments yeah. here in the Northern Gulf. At the weigh-in, there's a dude ready to roll. Yeah, if they got a million dollar fish, they'll have it printed. Oh. Yeah. Once you get the ink on, what I like to do is just... Blot the moisture away yeah, a little blot, bit, huh? Yeah, blot the extra ink away. Oh, that's pretty wild looking, man. It's the blackest triple tail I've ever seen in my yeah. life. <laughs> Looks like how they look down in that muddy water. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they look like. It's more realistic. All right, so you always want to do the rough side down, right? So that's the fibrous part. You know, this explains a lot. Somehow I was picturing my mind you laying that fish down on there rather oh. than laying that over the fish. And I was wondering about the three-dimensionality of the fish. Yeah, and it's really hard with certain size fish. Got to touch or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just start working the ink down. There's a lot of different types of paper that you can use. We are using a rice paper today. 
What'd you use yesterday? <laughs> Nothing. Your first print's not gonna be necessarily your best print. It's like pancakes. As you go through, you build the ink up, you blot it, take some of the excess ink off, and you'll start getting better prints three, four, five in. And then you can get multiple prints. You might if I put a little acid do it here and get a little darker print on that tail? <laughs> do whatever you want. You ever see this move? Oh, you're actually doing it right now, never mind. <laughs> oh, you know what? I printed the damn towel. <laughs> see that? <laughs> well, let's see how it turns ah. out. Let's see. Oh, got some creases Bottom. on it. Nah, it's got some creases, but. Mm. Oh, that's OK. Oh, that's a good one. That's beautiful. It's a good fish. I like it. Let's make another one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good one. Keep yeah, that's a good one. It looks good. Of course, the best part about catching your own fish is being able to enjoy it as fresh as it can get. OK, you guys doing three raw preparations? Yep. Semi-raw, yeah. Snapper. Mangrove snapper. Mangrove snapper you're going to make. Ceviche. And then uh, poke. Poke. We made of cobia. And we're also going to do some cobia sashimi. That's my favorite, man. I got a top and hot sauce to go with the sashimi. A lot of people don't think of cobia as a raw. No, oh, man, I loved it. It's fantastic raw. One of the things I appreciate about Greg and Brandon is that they take cooking fish as seriously as hunting fish, and they take the hunting pretty seriously. In fact, Brandon went to culinary school and worked in the restaurant biz before one too many night shifts inspired him to explore other career paths. So you got that trim trim. Trimmed, yeah. All so right, when a lot of people complain about a fishy ceviche or anything raw like that, it's usually because they're not cutting the bloodline out of it. So mm. you want to do a really good job cutting all the red off of fish. That's where a lot of fishy taste comes from. So once you get it all cubed up. Orange juice, quickly. lemon juice. Orange, lime, lemon. Equal parts. A little stir, and you'll start seeing it turn white pretty mm -hmm. quickly. And then uh, you like to put it in the fridge, not just leave it out on the counter? Yeah, for about a half hour. Then put your veggies in. Put my veggies in. That way the fish can cook, and we're not, we're not cooking the, the vegetables mm -hmm. right off the get-go. Now we're going to get started with the poke. I like cobia for this. I would make uh, tuna this way. Uh, Rainbow Runner would mm -hmm. be another excellent preparation. We've got a mixture of green onions and very thinly sliced red onion in the bowl. Try to go light on the sauce to start with, just enough to coat. You don't want it to be a soup. We'll give this a little stir. There we go. That's ready to go. Finally, Brandon starts slicing more of that cobia super thin for my favorite, sashimi. That's pretty, man. You know what's like unfair about the whole freshwater world? Like where I grew up. There's no fish that's good like this. You know what I mean? There's no fish running around in the lakes and rivers of the Midwest that you would just slice up and eat raw. Go sashimi. Yeah, it's not that kind of fish. Having sat in the fridge, our snapper has now been cooked a bit by the citrus and is ready for the ceviche fixins. So at this point, I would just start adding whatever you want. Red onion's good, good amount of cilantro. Seeded tomato. Seeded tomato, so you can cut the tomatoes and squeeze the seeds out of them. What? You don't want the, the runny, the water, oh, watery. Like It'll just make everything watery and yep. unflavorful. And some jalapeno, a little sea salt in there, a little dab of hot sauce. Yeah. <laughs> that's spot on. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, man, that's refreshing. Yeah. It makes a great lunch on the boat. Yeah, that's fantastic. That Kobe be like good entry level sashimi. It's just mm -hmm. a really good, neutral, well textured fish. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a go on the poke, see what you think. Do our poke. Mm. That's the best one yet. You like it? Oh, yeah. And that sauce. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's worthwhile coming down here. Oh, there is nothing like that swimming around in the waters of Montana. <laughs> the mighty brown trout just does not compare. Damn, that's good. Brandon, thanks, man. For having me out. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, Greg. We'll do it again. Fun. Thanks for all the stuff, yeah. all the mentoring. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be going home with a few bags full of that, man. Yeah, it's really something.